So we're going to start again with uh, foundation of all good qualities. And remember that this is a summary of the Lam Rim. So if you're getting lost at any point, where are we in the Lam Rim? What is the whole thing? What's the order of things? Part of the reason why we recite the foundation of all good qualities is to remind ourselves of the key topics and the key things that we want to develop. So um, just uh, listen with clear mind, open heart. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to them is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, Please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pradamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this. Train in supreme bodhicitta and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, Please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows and samaya. As I've become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajradhara. And so sitting with that, and relax your attention. Okay, so I thought today we could talk a little bit about karma from the perspective of instinct 
and karma from the perspective of intuition. And these two levels at which habit energy play out in our life. So if, uh, if I say the word instinct and I say the word intuition, do you have Hebrew words that immediately pop into mind or do you need a, a vocab discuss real quick? Intuition, instinct are words you know? Yeah, okay. So when we're talking about karma, there is the positive ripple effect of habit and the negative ripple effect of habit. And even though we've said it a million times, you cannot hear the word karma and think fate. If you think fate or destiny or punishment or reward, you've misunderstood. Yeah, because that implies someone doing it or a divine force making it or something that is finite or permanent or predestined. So please hear karma as habit and then the reflections of habit, okay? So just kind of click back into that. I know that you know, but sometimes even still, when I hear karma come up in conversation, it's still, I hear kind of like flavors of that or like echoes of that old kind of understanding. So just kind of <laughs> become aware. Um, I thought that maybe we would start first, though, with just a little bit more about Bardo, because it seemed like there was some interest in the conversation of Bardo. And Bardo very much ties into the conversation of karma and habit energy and projections and reflections. So I want to read you this part from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the commentary by Chugyam Trumpa Rinpoche, because I think it's really... Um, a very accessible way of understanding the bardo, the intermediate state. So I'll read that and we'll just check in about bardo and then we'll move in to the karma section. So the book describes the death experience in terms of different elements of the body going deeper and deeper. So as we've said many times, physically you feel heavy when the earth element dissolves into water and when the water dissolves into fire you find that circulation begins to cease functioning. When fire dissolves into air, any feeling of warmth or growth begins to dissolve. And when air dissolves into space, you lose that last feeling of contact with the physical world. Finally, when space or consciousness dissolves into the central nadi, there is a sense of internal luminosity, an inner glow, when everything has become completely introverted, the clear light mind, right? But such experiences happen constantly. The tangible logical state dissolves and one is not quite certain whether one is attaining enlightenment or losing one's sanity. Whenever that experience happens, it can be seen in four or five different stages. First, the tangible quality of physical living logic becomes vague. In other words, you lose physical contact. Then you automatically take refuge in a more functional situation, which is like the water element. You reassure yourself that your mind is still functioning. In the next stage, the mind is not quite sure whether it is functioning properly or not something begins to cease operating in its circulation. The only way to relate to it is through emotions. You try to think of someone you love or hate, something very vivid, because the watery quality of the circulation does not work anymore. So the fiery temperature of love and hate becomes more important. Even that gradually dissolves into air and there is a faint experience of openness. So there is a tendency to lose your grip on concentrating on love or trying to remember the person you love. The whole thing seems to be hollow inside. The next experience is luminosity. You are willing to give in because you cannot struggle anymore and a kind of carelessness arises in that moment. It is though pain and pleasure are occurring at the same time. 
or a powerful shower of icy cold water and boiling hot water is pouring simultaneously over your body. It is an intense experience, very powerful and full. The experience of oneness with both pain and pleasure are the same. The dualistic struggle of trying to be something is completely confused by two extreme forces of hope for enlightenment and fear of becoming insane. The two extremes are so concentrated that it allows a certain relaxation. And when you do not struggle anymore, the luminosity presents itself naturally. The next step is the experience of luminosity in terms of daily life. The luminosity is neutral ground or background, a gap when the intensity slackens. Then some intelligence begins to connect it to the awakened state of mind, leading to a sudden glimpse of meditated experience or Buddha nature, which could also be called the Dharmakaya. But if we have no means of connecting with basic intelligence and confused energy still dominates our process of mind, then the energy builds up blindly and finally falls down into different levels of diluted energy, so to speak, from the absolute energy of the luminosity. <clears throat> Some basic tendency of grasping begins to develop in the state of luminosity. And from that experience of the six realms of the world developing according to our intensity, but that tenseness or tightness cannot just function by itself without an activator of energy. In other words, energy is being used in order to grasp. We can now look at the six realms of the world from the point of view of different types of instinct. So what Jugim Trumba is describing is what happens when the consciousness leaves the body and is then in the Bardo experience, but he's also describing daily life. So in daily life in transition, there are these times when we're sort of unmindful, slightly disconnected, slightly disassociated, and then become aware of that, kind of half panic and seek to stimulate. And we seek to stimulate ourselves back into life by remembering a drama, right? Something we hate or something we love or something we're intrigued by or something we're seeking. And we kind of like give our life back to ourselves, but it's through the power of kind of chaotic emotions. And sometimes it feels both stressful and entertaining like pleasure and pain kind of merge together, you know, and then sometimes we can reconnect with our spiritual path or our refuge or just spacious mindfulness and presence. But it's interesting to kind of tap into these moments of gap and what happens to us in these intermediate states throughout a day and the way in which appearances of the external world change related to what our karmic projections are and how much control we have over that in these transitional states. So the elements, you know, they're operating all the time for us during our life and then they dissolve one by one at the time of death, at the time of sneezing and sleep, etc. But throughout the day, they kind of take turns being dominant. Um, in Tibetan medicine, they talk about the three humors, wind and bile and phlegm <laughs> related to the different elements. And kind of, you know, throughout the day, there's days when you can really see it as a snapshot of your life, right? Where like, there's the parts of the day where you're traditionally vague and dominated by ignorance. There's the time in the day when you're mildly irritated and annoyed and anger is kind of bubbling. And there's the times in the day where you feel kind of warm and expansive, but also a little bit grasping and needy and attachment is more dominant. You know, and there's kind of like chapters in the day and different things that might wake up those tendencies and those kind of instinctual behaviors or knee jerk habitual behaviors. And the question becomes then, how do we respond to those old habits by shifting from kind of 
animal instinct, habit, lizard brain, you know, however you want to describe it, into something that is more in the realm of enlightened intuition or mindful intuition or wisdom-based intuition, which is tapping into a nut whole other stream of habits. Because you have your habits from beginningless time of neuroses and psychoses and afflictions, and it's it's a problem, but you also have your habits of kindness and compassion and altruism and empathy and wisdom. You know, you kind of have these parallel streams and which one are you gonna enter into? And it's during these bardos, these intermediate states where there is heightened choice to kind of switch from neurotic to more enlightened or to switch from afflicted to more wise. So the bardo at death is very important, but the bardos during the day maybe are more so for us while we're in training. Um, thoughts on that so far? Is, is intermediate state or transitional periods during the day something that is interesting or you talk about? I, I have a question though. Uh, it's interesting, it has a lot of implications to everyday life uh, and uh, if, if you are aware of your mental processes and in therapy as well uh, there is a question here. no no i mean there is a question here uh, if you could say a word uh, about intuition about this moment that you're choosing to move to a, or to a higher level of consciousness or to be or to transformation what we would say you know that you are leaving yourself and going up. What does it have uh, uh, with intuition? Could you explain this word? Well, you know, it's this is my framing to try and make it more accessible. Karma is talking about habit, good and bad, projections, accurate and inaccurate. When we talk in life, we talk in terms of things that are like autopilot. You know that we do subconsciously or without choosing in an obvious way, just patterns and repetitions. And it's like we have two streams of that. We have one that is very basic and survival and animal and often afflicted also. It wouldn't be as problematic if we were actually animals. But because we're not animals, acting from an animal place causes horrible destruction. Then we also have the more like intuition, intuitive, some people would say their, their heart wisdom or their gut feeling. You know, I don't know if you have these expressions in Hebrew, but you know, like your, I don't know, like your core wisdom. Yeah, or your like higher self, I don't know. Maslow's hierarchy integrated, top of the pyramid, I don't know. But you know, this, this part of you that has wisdom even before you met psychology or Buddhism or anything, a part of you that had a deep, calm, reflective knowing. And we would call that maybe intuition colloquially. But in terms of karma, it's like, we're trying to consciously feel the gaps in the day as opportunities to switch paths, you know, to switch from afflicted to wi wisdom because we have both trains in us or both rivers in us. And they're both, you know, very strong. And once you have momentum and once things are really going, it's hard to shift gears. But in those moments of bardo in the day, it's like there's a little bit of a, a gateway to switch. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so we're choosing to have an agenda with our mindfulness, which is checking for gaps, which is looking for opportunities of transition, which is understanding that sometimes when momentum is going, like with an affliction, all you can do is damage control and try not to make things worse and try not to hurt yourself and others. And sometimes that's all you can do once the momentum is going. But then the momentum will start to kind of fade and decrease and soften. And sometimes our habit is to justify how we just felt and what we were just saying to ourselves and to reinforce it and get a whole nother cycle of that afflicted momentum going again. 
But also if we feel the affliction settling and our mindfulness is aware that now is our chance to shift gears, you bring back in your altruistic motivation and kind of click from affliction back to wisdom. You know, so it's like in a way being a bit more natural with the flow of your life, not forcing things, you're realizing that there are points at which your mind is able to shift gears. And there are points at which your mind can't shift gears enough to fundamentally change how you're viewing things, but you have enough memory of the harm you've caused under its influence that you can at least stop speaking or stop acting physically from that place while the mental energy kind of runs out of gas. You know, so it's like this conditioned mindfulness that is checking, can I make an adjustment right now? You know, in a way that's smooth and organic and doesn't feel forced, that's transformative as opposed to abrupt. You know, can I shift from kind of lower to higher or am I just in damage control mode? And then, you know, there's also like you're on a good road, you know, you're full of compassion, full of wisdom, really good momentum. And then the energy of that starts to fade and the opportunity to kind of switch lower is arising. You know, maybe at work, you're in a good space and then you get home and the transition of now I get to relax could change the form of compassion and wisdom into just another good thing or could change into some sort of series of behaviors that are damaging for yourself and others. You know, and so you know that's a transition in life where you could choose up or choose down, you know. So it's just kind of noticing the bardos to then water the right karmic seeds or to encourage the right habitual patterns and reinforce the ones that you want to strengthen. Good so far? Qualms, additions? Clear or confusing? Oh, it's clear, it's clear. But if we had the, if we could go through a systematic way to cultivate this moment of battles, so it's like a resolution, you know, for a lot of, uh, because this, one should be, it can't be just instinctively, it must be cultivated because otherwise you are self cherished uh, normally or what you do, you know, when you are not aware. But the way to become aware to these battles, to train your mind, to have a systematic way to train your mind into these battles could be a big solution. <laughs> Well, it's just mindfulness, right? Like it, you're bringing it into awareness, right? So, so it's like intellectually you have to talk about the fact that there's transitional points, which is something that probably has occurred to you in some form or the other, something that we've talked about in some way or the other. But now that we're talking about it in a specific way, you're now comparing that to your memory of your own life. And you think about, okay, on an ordinary day, when is my mind on autopilot that's good? When is it autopilot that's bad? When are the classic times when I can shift gears, but I don't, or I can shift gears, but I choose not to, you know? And you're just kind of really sitting with it as a reflection. And that is then imbuing your mindfulness. Because th this is what we're talking about all the time in the Mahayana is that passive mindfulness is not that useful. It's good for concentration. Maybe you'll avoid dementia, that's great. But passive mindfulness is not the point of the Mahayana. We want active mindfulness with an agenda. And the agenda becomes fuller and deeper the more study you do. So it's not like you have every point of the Dharma like actively in words, you know, obsessively coloring your life. It's that whatever you've touched in class and whatever you've touched in reflective meditation or analytical meditation, then is like coloring your mindfulness to check, is this a bardo right now? Or is this a time I have to let it play out and just do damage control? Or I'm in a good momentum and I don't have to mess with it because it's going well. But now your mindfulness is colored by a new or a deeper understanding of 
there is a bardo throughout the day that I can look for and many of them, you know? So it just becomes one more thing that you're bringing into your mindfulness, just like you're trying to bring altruism into your mindfulness and concentration in general. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna just kind of leave it to you guys to talk amongst yourselves for five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. And just kind of like, how does that sit? and um, see if you come to any ideas or conclusions that you feel like sharing with me, but just talk for five minutes in Hebrew to each other. How do you feel about this concept of bardo? Okay, and I'm turning off my camera. Off you go, five minutes, I'll be back. Okay, did that not work at all? Did you talk at all? Or did you just stare yeah, and stare? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good, good. Uh, any any thoughts to share? There was a question about this uh, making it uh, systemizing uh, uh, how to make this area of Bardo uh, systematically in uh, our daily presence. Uh, and what I question it, uh, also thinking that because uh, while you were uh, showing yourself back, I thought that uh, I remember my teacher, so I can, uh, it's a way to go back to, uh, <coughs> to this uh, mode of, uh, and, well, and this is the point is that it's, it's a question of, you don't have to make a bardo, bardos happen, right? Bardos happen because of many, many causes and conditions. The training is to notice, to notice the bardo. Like for example, like think in the world, think politically. Sometimes there's a belief that many people have a change that is ready to happen for a long time, but it can't until there's a gap or there's a space or there's that kind of opportunity. It's a time of transition where something many people have felt for many years or decades finally is able to land and ripen and change. You know, you can't punch a hole and force it to happen, but you can gently move towards the gap that is coming anyway. It's kind of two different ways of looking at it. Of course, we want to try and create bardos when we're in a bad space and i think remembering one's teacher is a great idea remembering a mantra can interrupt a negative pattern you know just a mantra it protects the mind you just omani pe me hum until you shift gears but what i'm inviting us to do is to notice the gaps rather than force the gaps notice that throughout the day there are countless opportunities to shift back into the priorities of life or to shift back into your meaning and purpose your altruistic intention and it might be that you've stayed there and just noticing the gap reinforces it and deepens it and it might be that you've slipped and now you can make it go back up <laughs> but part of the thing is to realize that there are these transitions in a day, there are these transitions in a life, there are these transitions in relationships, in countries, in workplaces, and forcing a transition is less effective than noticing when there's an opening. Yeah, so you want to be ready is the point. You want to be ready when there is an opening, because if there's an opening but you're not prepared, then you miss the window. This is, this is what I meant. This moment of opening, it's, 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 uh, and it connected to the quality of wondering, of, of wow. Yeah, exactly. Ah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, in a way, it can make it feel, I guess, it can take the tension and the stress out of a lot of things if you realize 
I have my meaning and purpose in life. I have an altruistic intention of some kind. I need to enact that internally as much as I can. And there's limited opportunity externally where my impact will be noticed and felt and effective. But having the continuous background awareness that's always reinforcing itself means that when there are windows of opportunity to be of benefit outside, I won't miss them. You know, the windows won't just shut without me being organized. And, to, you know, I don't want to be disassociated and distracted and, you know, kind of ungrounded when my moment of truth arrives. Of course, if it arrives and I forget and I don't notice, oh, well, there'll be another one and another one and another one. But it can kind of make you relax into here is my stance towards life. And generally, it's just an internal conversation that I keep reinforcing and reawakening whether in words or in atmosphere, internal atmosphere. And sometimes there are opportunities to be of benefit externally and sometimes they aren't. Just as internally, there are gaps when I can wake it up and strengthen it and times when I just have to keep going as I'm going and times when it could dip and I need to bring it back up. But yeah, it's, it's noticing the gaps as opposed to forcing the gaps. I would like to ask uh, when you speak about instinct and uh, intuition in relation to Bardo, uh, what is the meaning? Because I'm asking, um, because as I understand it, in the Bardo, there is a completely different state of mind, a uh, mind of oneness, not of duality, as uh, the Valpino knows. No, in the clear light mind before the Bardo, there is a, a moment of kind of natural non-dual before the bardo, in the clear light mind, before the mind has left the body. And if we recognize it, we can develop our realization of emptiness then. And then what comes next is going to be very positive for our spiritual path, whether it's rebirth in a pure land or another human rebirth with good conditions. It's going to be something that facilitates our path as opposed to the type of rebirth where it's too painful or too distracting. So the clear light is naturally non-dual. Usually we don't recognize it. So it's like we have a breath of, oh, that's nice to feel that way, and back into my old habit. Mm -hmm. The bardo is basically just like the dream state. And we want to be a lucid dreamer as opposed to a non-lucid dreamer. You know, so when we are in the bardo, we want to be aware it's the bardo and our projections will be the same sort of projections of our life. You know, whether it's angels and demons or it's characters from our favorite shows or it's all of our relatives arguing with us or it's all of our friends loving us or it's beautiful scenery or scary traumas. It's just your same stuff. It's just dreamlike projections. And we're training ourselves in one, not believing the projections to be real, and two, noticing when there's a gap to shift the karma that's ripening, to water different seeds so that it's more conducive to the spiritual path. And that's what we're trying to do in the day, right? Not just in the bardo, it's in the day. We're trying not to believe all of our projections. We're noticing the projections to be projections, you know, that from the side of the outside world, there's what, 5%, the rest is just all our projection, yeah? And if, as soon as we recognize that, we're not as hooked by the drama, and then we can consciously water different seeds, and then our growth can be more smooth, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm trying to understand what Sparta seems like being uh, consciousness uh, without the it's like it's the same consciousness as we have in our daily life but in the body we don't have the body and we, we are not in a samsara yet so what, what will be the difference between the body and our daily life not much yeah no body yeah it basically it's like a dream right I mean, you're like it's a dream so it's, it's a subtler level of consciousness because a dream state is subtler than our coarse everyday experience, right? The mind is coarse, subtle, and extremely subtle. 
So the subtle mind is operating in the bardo. It was the extremely subtle mind that was manifest at the clear light. But as soon as you leave the body, it becomes slightly more coarse again. And you're riding on like a body of wind or energy or chi. And you're basically being propelled by your karma to your next rebirth. And that bardo experience, which is a dreamlike experience of subtler consciousness, but still conditioned by your same old habits and karma. You're not like magically purified, it's just your same old habits, which obviously, hopefully were launched in a good way at your death. Hopefully at your death, you had a peaceful mind, a mind connected with altruism and refuge. So hopefully then your projections in the bardo will be happy, conducive ones. But the bardo experience can last kind of up to 49 days, human days. But within that space, there are micro deaths. So even if you had a terrible death, every seven days is another opportunity to shift which karma is ripening for your rebirth. So, you know, these are the things that, that are described in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. These are the things that Guru Rinpoche Padmasambhava saw experientially in his meditation, that Shakyamuni Buddha saw experientially in his meditation, but countless other meditators as well. For us to feel some sense of the truth of it, it helps us to remember what it's like in a dream state when we become awake to the dream. It might be that the details of the dream don't dramatically change, but our level of control does. The control, you know, when you're the control thing is important, I think. And maybe we as secular people and the psychoanalysts are trying uh, to understand reasons and to control the uh, processes. So, uh, but what you just, uh, when you say Bardo happens or whatever, or what I said that you have to remember your teacher, to remember your teacher, you, it must go through a process of internal, of internal, like, tra transmuting internal, like something, which yeah. you don't control. So it has- Yes, to, you do. No, internalization is something that happens. You oh, when you use the word, yeah. Yeah, no, but when you say like this, when you're finishing a meditation, like something like higher forces than myself. So actually you, you have to agree that there yeah. are- to say that you don't have any control of, although you must be ethic, ethical, and it's a very, very gentle uh, boundary between being ethical, do things, and uh, 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 practicing uh, your consciousness or to enlarge your consciousness and to leave it for higher forces. Because what you said, Bardo happens, so they are happening, so you just have to be aware of them. And awareness, you said, causes and conditions and circumstances. But it's you habit. Iris, it's just repetition, right? You have to decide it's a good idea, then you have to reinforce it on purpose with some discipline. No right? problem this decision. I try to understand. Yeah. <laughs> so then again, again, it comes easier. You know, it's just practice makes perfect. Um, so, it, you know, it's like if someone said to you, you have to remember that on Thursdays, you must only wear green shoes you know, something ridiculous. Well, you will forget some Thursdays, but if it's very important, eventually you will remember Thursdays are the days that you wear green shoes, you know, and then it will become so natural that you almost don't have to think about it. But in the beginning, you might have to like put them in front of the door and set an alarm and make a big sign, you know? So for us with our bardos, we have to first use memory, you know, first think historically in my life, when are the transition points and what do they look like? Because that'll make it easier to catch them in real time, you know? Maybe there's a really crucial moment when you wake up where it could be a good mood or a bad mood, where you could give in to the suffering of your body and let it turn into irritability or angst, or you could decide to use it in a transformative way to open your heart towards compassion. And there's a moment of truth every morning. Or maybe mornings are no big deal, but around lunchtime, you start to feel heavy and you start to get a little bit low energy. And that's a point at which you could give in to a certain habit of neuroses. So you just make a very small practical plan. Today, when can I catch some of the bardos? and lift into something that is more wisdom-based. 
you know, and you just make very small practical plans. And this is in the teachings on karma in the four opponent powers that we talk about with purification, making these tiny plans that are very achievable and don't overwhelm us is the way to start building continuity. Yeah, so, you know, at the end of the day, you just think, when did I catch my gaps? When did I miss them? Tomorrow, what's one I can catch? And you repeat it, and you dedicate, and you go to sleep. And then you remind yourself in the morning, and slowly your behavior changes. You know, it's, yeah, it's just gradual. So um, the meditation is going to be on um, karma in terms of the 10 non-virtues and catching kind of your habitual versions of each of the 10 non-virtues. So if you want to shift um, to meditation, and then we'll do a little bit more on karma next week, but I'll send you a handout with kind of the main features of karma. And if you could read pages 117 to 118 and practicing the path, and I'll send you an email reminder. So I'll talk to the last three and the rest of you go meditate. <laughs>